we didn't always get it quite right. But I want you to know, from the bottom of my heart, this is Gun Cranks. <laughs> Hey there, everybody. Yes, it's us again, the Gun Cranks. We're back. I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat, along with American Handgunner editor Tom McHale and our affable special projects editor Roy Huntington. Hey, guys, how's it going? I have no idea. Peachy man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, as usual, it's completely disjointed from the get go, and that's how we run things here on Gun Cranks. Today we're going to talk about single actions, we're going to talk about the cool stuff hopefully going on over at Colt, and then we're going to talk about something that Tom McHale is very familiar with, bar fights. So let's get started on this edition of The Gun Cranks. You guys going to fill me in on the agenda before the no. show? or no. I, don't, I don't have a big is, but okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Okay. You know, just because something is ancient technology doesn't always mean, mean that it doesn't make sense anymore. I mean, yeah, do I want to drive across country in a Model T Ford? Well, no, probably not, although I know people who try to do that. But some kinds of technology are still relevant. And even though someone may want to argue the point, I say single action revolvers are still relevant. Gentlemen, <laughs> would you like to wade in? <laughs> Brent? Well, we just put a, a beautiful one on the cover of American Handgunner. Yes, the you did. September, October edition from uh, a very fancy Cimarron in America's caliber, 45 Colt, engraved, gold inlaid from the folks at Baron Engraving. It is drop dead gorgeous and shoots. <sighs> Well, you know, I've got to say, when I became the editor of Guns Magazine, I mean, who doesn't love, you know, the, the old peacemakers, the single action armies, the Vaquero like I've got here. But I, I didn't figure too many people other than maybe cowboy action shooters, but a lot of folks still carry these things. And, you know, especially when you're talking Ruger Blackhawks and Red Hawks and all these kind of things, there's a lot of folks walking around, especially outdoors, with single actions on their hip and it opened my eyes to the fact that uh, they're more than just fun. They're still a very practical weapon to carry. Some folks even carry them for self-defense, don't they, Roy? <laughs> well, you know, I think there's two things especially going for these guns. Is number one, they're easily available in substantial calibers. This is a Taylor & Company 357 Magnum gun. Uh, and one of the things that I think is an advantage is if you do the cowboy load, and we did a video on how, how to do this, so you can load the gun and then carry it with a hammer down on an empty chamber, you have an absolutely safe big bore handgun that's readily accessible and readily available. All you have to do is cock the hammer, you know, like pumping an 870 shotgun barrel but yet it's absolutely 100% safe. And it's, it's, it's really easy, actually. You just you load one, skip one, load four, then cock and lower the hammer. But watch the video before you actually try it. But I think that's one <laughs> of the advantages of these guns. And so you can load that gun, sit it on your nightstand, and it can stay there for 150 years if you want to. And if you pick it up and cock it, it's gonna shoot. And I think that's a lot uh, to be said for that. The, uh, the thing I thought was interesting was when I retired from the police department, I went to work for Bianchi International. I was their national law enforcement sales manager and then later their marketing director. But I was amazed at the single action holsters that we used to sell for duty carry. And it, well, and unbeknownst to me, across the South, especially, you know, Texas and, you know, kind of all around in those areas, all the way down to Florida, the, there were still and still are sheriffs who carry these guns on duty. Now, granted, if you're the sheriff of a small town, you may not be having to engage in a running gunfight with a you know, bunch of gangsters. And so I think a lot of these guys wore these guns at more of a badge of, of office than anything. A barbecue gun and engraved Colt single action in a, a really pretty, you know, Bianchi single action holster. But nonetheless, you know, here it was almost the year 2000 and cops were carrying these guns for personal defense. And then I also found that our non-sworn customers 
used to call regularly and ask the customer service gals, hey, I've got this Ruger Blackhawk and I like to carry it for personal protection. You know, what do you have in concealment holsters for it? So there's always been a core group of sort of hardcore pistol arrows, I think, who who still admire the, you know, the ability that these guns have. Yeah. Well, Tom, you little, literally wrote the book on defensive handguns and, and stuff like that. What's your thoughts? You know what? I kind of like them. <laughs> hey, Roy, and Roy, Roy hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's a... Uh, okay, you got, lots of, you got lots of potential benefits. You have a, can I say, gorgeous trigger on most nice single-action revolvers. I mean, you're, you're doing most of the work with the hammer cock, right? which gives you a nice safety margin to shoot that that revolver that Roy's holding you have to be very intentional and deliberate about it you know you're not you're not you know fingering that trigger and firing off a shot loosening off a shot unintentionally you've got cock the hammer you got aim you got pull the trigger um, I mean there's a lot to be said for it you know capacity is a little bit of an issue but uh, I guess you got to be careful right I do I do love the concept for out and about in the woods you know, day hunting, working outside, whatever it is you may you may be doing outside, just something to have on your side. Because as as Roy more eloquently stated, uh, it is a safe gun. And again, you got to be intentional about it when when you're ready to shoot. You know, Taffin. What's not to like? Taffin, some of his most favorite <laughs> guns are what he calls perfect packing pistols, and you know, four mm -hmm. inch barrel, three fifty seven ish or bigger. Uh, and something that's safe and easy and reliable to carry. Uh, around my property here, I keep a Freedom Arms three and a half inch barrel, 45 Colt uh, single action uh, in a kind of a low safe flap cross draw holster. I keep that on a nail in the garage. And if I'm gonna spend the, the day on the tractor, I just throw that on real quick. And so we've got boars coming in now and you, know, and you never know, two legged critters and stuff like that. But, uh, it's safe and everything. I think the big challenge for people, and this is something it, I'd like to be semi-serious even for a minute and just say, you can't just go buy one of these guns and load it mm -hmm. and think that you're gonna protect yourself because they have a particular mm -hmm. manual of arms that you have to learn. You have to learn how to manipulate these guns and you have to learn how to safely load and yeah. unload them. And what do you do yeah. when the hammer's cocked and now you don't wanna shoot? How do you safely lower the hammer on a loaded cartridge? Because these guns will shoot. If, if your thumb slips off. I was fortunate enough to attend about three Thunder Ranch pre-1900 classes. And what we did there was we actually learned to fight with these old guns. And so we, we geared up in Western gear and we had single action guns and lever actions and side-by-side -side shotguns. And Clint, the brilliant sort of tactician and think outside of the box guy that he is, opened up all of our eyes to just an amazing cross-section of things that we had no idea of. And I think all of us, the takeaway was, if you have especially a pair of single action revolvers and a lever action rifle, there's, you have nothing to fear, <laughs> you know? I mean, if, if you know how to manipulate these guns and keep them in the fight, uh, gosh, you don't have a lot, you know, that's hindering you. But the secret, and I've said over and over and over and over again, which is you have to learn to manipulate the gun and you have to learn how to fight with one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, with nine millimeters, everybody's looking for the, the perfect load and you know, bullets are a lot better today, so they are more effective, but you put that on a bad guy, there's, there's not much question. So, but you know what guys, and you make absolutely valid arguments, um, but I'm gonna go a different direction here. <laughs> It's funny to me, we spend a lot of time and mental energy justifying our choices when, frankly, it's just a cool gun to shoot. They are a thing of beauty. They're mechanically really cool. How, you know, um, think about what it takes to get this cylinder to rotate, line up with the bore, and go off without blowing up. I mean, the engineering's fantastic. They're just cool. And then you get into the whole backstory and the history of them. This is one of the few guns that I got to say, when I'm shooting, it takes me to another place. I mean, every gun means something to me. Um, I like shooting modern, you know, black polymer pistols and all that stuff. But I, I don't care who you are. When you're shooting, especially an old single action like this, um, a cowboy style gun, if, if you're not hearkening back at least for a split second to the old west, 
you have no spirit left in your soul and you might as well pack it in because <laughs> i mean honestly that's hey, what well, we do speaking of hearkening back uh we just put to bed the uh this year's old west uh special edition and uh one of our our talented writers frank jardim did a piece on what's called the slip gun and uh, basically for those who aren't familiar it's a single action pistol just like the one you're holding with the trigger removed <laughs> and there are more modifications than than that but uh it this definitely falls into the do not do this at home <laughs> category uh because you fire the thing by pulling the hammer back all the way or else things can go wrong and letting it fly so super fast uh old-timey defensive gun and uh, frank actually built one oh. you know he said hey if i'm going to write about this thing in the history of it i'm going to build one and test it under exceptionally carefully <laughs> controlled <laughs> conditions right and uh, he did just that and i believe some of his parting words were i will never do this again <laughs> you know, it is wow. it, it is highly effective and highly dangerous so uh, just an interesting bit of history there that you can uh, read about in the, up the upcoming issue Very well you cool. know i i think they're all highly effective and they're all highly dangerous and uh i think as long as we remember that as brent says i'm i'm with these be more about what he says than anything which is they're classic they're historical they're fun and uh, I think that's why we all enjoy them, and we don't have to have to justify it necessarily. So uh, exactly, yeah, I agree with you. Just go do it, but get a little training if you do do it, right, Brent? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And then just go out and shoot. You don't need a reason. Just go out and shoot, and have fun, and be safe, and have fun. Hey guys, I want to talk about inside dope here, industry stuff. I mean, we've uh, we've all seen companies, big names, you know, Smith and Wesson, and Colt, Remington, uh, kind of lose their way over the years, and uh, uh, in some cases, run iconic names into the ground, right? Uh, but almost, fortunately, almost invariably, we've also seen some some tremendous turnarounds on some of these brands, and uh, you know, some things have been happening recently in the world that people not be aware of. Uh, so let's, I wanted to chat about that a little bit. I mean, look at the, uh, for example, the, the Colt situation. Uh, they've recently been acquired by CZ, an outstanding company who builds phenomenal guns. What do you think? Well, good thing or bad thing? It's going to be a great thing. I mean, CZ, uh, you know, has been a very aggressive and innovative and for them to, to pick up Colt, you know, I was expecting things to change, but we had an interesting little anecdote the other day. Uh, we had somebody go there for meetings, and the the person was reporting to all of us that they had actually painted the lobby. The lobby needed painting, and something as simple as buying a couple of gallons of paint tells me that if they're going to pay attention to those little details, maybe they'll start paying attention to all the other really important details. So I think that's such an insignificant thing, but just sprucing up the building tells you that there's new energy, there's new focus. Um, I think that's going to carry through to their mm -hmm. product lineup. Yeah. You know, I was, right. yeah, I, I have a lot of respect for the leadership at, at uh, CZ. Uh, America and including the leadership of the European side of the company and I think Americans think CZ is this oh that's this little company it's like oh no you know I've been to their yeah. factory in the Czech Republic and it's like a half a mile <laughs> you know <laughs> and the thing that struck me when I was there uh, I met with with the president of CZ at the time the, of the whole company and uh, and I talked to administrative people and I talked to factory workers on the floor and engineers and I, and I just really got a nice cross-sectional tour of everything. And I came away with a couple of things that really left a lasting impression on me. Number one was a penchant for high quality. It's, it's, it truly is what they talk about all the time. It's like, how do we do this and how do we do this better? And remember, this is the company that made the CZ-75. and a whole long list of other iconic guns and other sort of engineering masterpieces through the years. And what really was interesting to me was that I saw absolutely high-end CNC machining while I was there, and then I saw like little old lady, like babushka looking ladies running manual mills and manual lathes. 
And I asked about that, and they said, well, there are some things that are best done that way. And I said, but doesn't that impact your ability to you know, get product out the door? And they just looked at me like I was a stupid American. It's like, well, well yeah, it does, but why would we not do it the best way that we can do it? You know? And I went, well, there's that, huh? Yeah. You know, so I, I've looked at how they've turned CZ USA around and then, of course, introduced the Dan Wesson line in 1911s, which I think you guys will agree with me are it's absolutely superior 1911 pistols, essentially custom yeah. guns. And uh, I was so pleased to see that they bought Colt. I think right now I'm guessing there's a lot of people at Colt being put on notice that it's it's time to let's straighten this out, you know? Well, you know, I, I think it's natural, like Tom pointed out, some of the other big companies, the legacy companies that, we try not to use this word too often, but are ubiquitous. You know, Remington, for example, growing up, they just made all mm -hmm. the ammo. Uh, Federal had some, but Remington was, you know, it, and they kind of lost their way. I think these big companies reach a point where they're so big, they've got so much management, and they've got, I think it's some of that, well, this is the way we've always done it, and that institutional malaise sets in, and it's it's natural. Yeah. You know, they've been around for uh, over 100 years, and, and it just kind of happens, but I think a new company coming in, especially a European company, and saying we expect more. Uh, that's a good thing, and that's I'm sure there are a few folks in uh, Hartford that are a little bit nervous because you know uh, they're going to have to start putting out. Well, you can't rest on your laurels, right? I mean, that's uh, the the president of CZUSA. I know her, and and don't rest on your laurels. You know, I mean. Uh, you either produce or, well, you're, or you're, you know, you're gone, I think. <laughs> Wait a minute. So is there tenure in the manufacturing world, in the, the corporate business world? I don't think so. Yeah. There's no yeah. tenure, right? Exactly. Well, but we've all seen it well, there though, in some of these be. old companies. Yeah. yeah, there shouldn't be, but there is. There There's, you know, be, yeah. crazy old Joe that they couldn't find anything to do with. So they put him, you know, on the CNC machine at the end, not doing much of nothing. Yeah. And that does yeah. happen. Well, you know, the, the, like any company, the leadership is, does drive the company, and we've seen that. I've seen it with Smith & Wesson, I've seen it with other companies. Ruger, Chris Colloy at Ruger is really driving the company, you know, yeah. and, and his, his energy and his uh, business acumen just infiltrates down through the entire company and, and, and brings everybody with him. So I, I think that's what you're going to see at at Colt now. You know, there's a. Let me tell you a real quick analogy. If you have a small business that does five hundred thousand dollars a year, and you lose fifty thousand dollars on a bad design idea, well, that could put you out of business. You know, and so then you call a meeting, and everyone gets in panic mode until they fix it. Well, if you're a, a hundred million dollar company, you can lose five million dollars, and unless somebody's paying attention, it doesn't really show anywhere you know and sales will be down a few percentage points and the R&D department might lay somebody off but overall it doesn't feel like it affects anything and that's the beginning of that malaise that Brent was talking about that's the beginning of the end and I think we've all seen it in the industry to companies yep. yeah so so guys let's end this with a vote so thumbs up or thumbs down CZ buying Colt I'm giving it a thumbs up I think Colt is gonna rock two thumbs yeah. up two thumbs up yeah Yep. Oh, combine the the classic revolvers with some outstanding new leadership. Uh, I can't I can't wait to see what comes out of it. And there. a quest for quality. Yeah, this is very yep. positive for everyone. And if you're listening, please support these companies. So. <laughs> Pow! Zap! Crash! Smash! Hey guys. Let's talk about bar fights here in this cop shop segment. Now, Tom, let's start with you. I'm going to pick on you. You've never been in a bar fight in your life, have you? I have, and I lost a perfectly good Seiko in the process. I mean, that thing probably cost $35. You know oh why? You, you ever seen Karate Kid? Yeah. Well, I okay, so I got to be fair. Um, you know, at the time, <laughs> I was just out of college, and I probably weighed a, a buck thirty-five, dripping wet. I was about as intimidating as a rhythmic gymnastics team, but um, but it, you know, I was kind of working at this this restaurant slash bar, so waiting tables, bartending, working the door sometimes on Friday and Saturday nights. So let's just say I was not um, not Chuck Norris at the door, but. 
But one night I did have a I did have an advantage over a guy who was being unruly, trying to trying to come in, and I wouldn't let him. And the advantage was I was sober and he was quite drunk. So, you know, he took a big old oh, slow mo. Is there a slow motion kind of roundhouse <laughs> swing at me? <laughs> and I did and I did paintbrush up and wax on. You know, with my watch hand, like wax on, wax <laughs> off, you know, like paint, because that's how I roll in my training, right? And uh, I did this, and he, he fist clocked me right in my Seiko, you know, and I, I felt pretty bad about that, and uh, hurt his hand, and then I kind of shoved him out the door, and that was that. And uh, so, wow. yeah, I'm kind of a badass when it comes to bar fights, so... <laughs> there you are. You yeah. and Chuck Norris, man. That qualifies. Yeah, well, yeah so. that qualifies, though. Yeah. You know, that's what, when we were talking about a topic for today, and I said, we haven't done a cop shop segment in a while, and I came up with this one because I was talking to some of the guys that are still working the other day, and I got to say, this is an old guy thing. The young guys, you know, they still have bar fights, but it's not like... I would say back in the day, right, Roy? Nowadays, if yeah. somebody gets in a fight in a bar, somebody go, goes and gets a gun or a knife and they kill each other. Back in my day, bar fights were almost recreational. I mean, you still got hit in the <laughs> face sometimes, but nobody tried to kill anybody. And that led to a lot of great stories among especially the old guys. I mean, <laughs> when, I when you're a like rookie... Can you guys I, I know, fill us I know. me in on that? What was it like to be old? Whatever. <laughs> Whatever, Chuck Norris. That's your new street name, Chuck, Chuck Norris. Norris. Chuck Norris, you know, rhythmic death, gymnast. <laughs> death one, once had a near uh, Tom McHale experience. So, yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, yep. No, but... the. Truly, it's funny, they actually listen to the stories of when, you know, as a rookie, you'd pull up to this bar on Friday night, and it literally looks like a TV show. There's people smashed up against windows, you might see something sailing out a window, and you walk in, and there's just four, five, six, eight, ten guys duking it out and breaking chairs over each other, and the fight is on. And most of the time, it was a lot of fun. Sometimes it wasn't, but most of the time, it was, uh, afterwards, it was pretty entertaining. So, Roy, you've, you've probably never been to one or two bar fights, right? I would always just try not to get hurt initially. Yeah, you know? yeah. Because <laughs> still walk in. I actually learned if you blew, if I blew my police whistle, because we still have police whistles. I carried one for decades after everyone stopped carrying them. Yeah. And if you just blow the snot out of your police whistle, everyone kind of goes, what the hell is that? <laughs> Why is he doing that? You know, That's pretty good. Now, every once in a while, yeah, people were serious and they were doing bad things to each other and yeah. stuff like that. But I, can, I mean, can this just deteriorate into telling a couple of bar fight stories? Oh, so, exactly. That was the point. I, I think one that will always stick in my mind was we got a call. You know, it goes, beep, beep, unit 189, you know, Delta, let's respond to a 415 bar fight at this neighborhood dive bar. And so... So we responded, and uh, and I got, we got there, and it's it was a mini me version of what you were talking about. It was a relatively small neighborhood bar, and it was actually pretty quiet inside. And so we we walked in, and we couldn't quite figure out what was going on. But two guys, and they had uh, bar stools, and they were in separate areas of the bar, and they were they were swinging them around like that, right? And so the bartender was like washing the counter and a couple guys were sitting at the bar drinking beer and a, guy, a couple guys were playing pool. And then, so these two guys were calling each other names, you know, hey, you're at, you're at some, oh yeah, well, yeah. you know, and they would move around the bar. And so I sidled over to the bartender and I said, did you call? He said, yeah. He said, you know, I got these guys. They go at it every once in a while. And I said, well, what are they doing? <laughs> you know, and he said, well, they're mad at each other. They're having a fight. And I said, well, they're not having a fight. They're waving the bar stools around. He said, well, they're blind. They can't, they, both of them are blind. And so they, they don't know where each other are. And so they'll, when they lose track of each other, one of them will call the other one a name, and then the fight will kind of go on. And then usually it's, and, and I watched it, and then so the bar stool things would kind of crash into each other every <laughs> once in a while. And one of them would drop a bar stool and reach out like this, but miss the guy completely and fall down on the floor. True story, I swear. So we <laughs> picked them up and put them back on their bar stools and told them to knock it off. And we said, I said, are you all right with this to the bartender? He says, oh, yeah, they're all right. He says, I just didn't want to, you know, bother with them right now. And so we, <laughs> oh. we, 
And of course, they're drunks, right? So the guys are saying, yeah, I appreciate you officers for being so understanding. We're just, we're old friends, you know, wow. Bob and I, we go, we just get a little pissed off every once in a while. <laughs> but I got, I wish we had had those, what are those mic or camera things they all wear on their oh, yeah, the body shirts nowadays? Now, yeah. That I would have had a viral YouTube video on that one, I oh, think, because yeah. these old guys swinging their chairs around. Well, you know, you had hearing impaired folks. I had a, a call with a, a deaf gentleman that we were driving around downtown. It was after the bars closed. We get a report of a fight outside the bar. So I'm literally a half block away. So I zip up, got the red lights going, and there's three guys duking it out on the ground. Fists are flying. So I jump out and I apply the first rule they teach you as a rookie. And I'm sure Roy's heard this. And this is good for Tom to know. Let them wear themselves out on each other. You don't dive in, you know, if unless yep. somebody's being well, killed. But most of the only, time they're just wearing each other. Only if you have a protective out. Seiko. If you're using that, yeah. you can jump yeah, right in. Like, oh, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they're there. You know, I'm going, hey, guys, come on, knock it off. It's the police. Da, 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 da. So and I'm even kind of <laughs> using my foot. Hey, get off him. Get off him. So finally, they're not getting off of him. And I think they're drunk and they think that I'm one of the buddies or something. So I finally start grabbing people off and I'm pushing them and shoving them and kind of get a little rough with them. And the guy on the bottom of the pile takes off and he's not running, but he's going pretty fast toward a dark alley. And I'm like, you know, what's going? Hey, you, 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 you know, and I'm trying to watch these two guys and this guy is, is leaving. So it turns into you two stay right here. Hey, buddy, right now. So finally he's, I don't know. 30 yards away and making tracks. So I tell him, stay here. And I go over to this guy and I'm yelling at him the whole time, police stop, stop right now. I'm going to arrest you. And I grab the guy and I spin him around and I'm ready to drill him right in the mouth. Okay. Well, that's back when you could do stuff like that. I was going to drop the guy because obviously he's fleeing the police. Right. And as soon as I turn around, he goes, he was hearing impaired. These guys had jumped him outside the bar, started beating up on him, and it's, all he knew was the two guys got off of him, so he's out of there. And so I turn around, and he said, God, you know, they, I understood them to say that they were beating up on him. And I turn around, and they're gone. So that would have looked really good. I let the two bad guys go, and I punched uh, the victim in the mouth. So... So it was a successful was, call. Yeah, then. Well, you, you ended up not having to do any paperwork, exactly. so that was a good call. That worked. You know? that, worked. <laughs> uh, that is very funny. I know what you mean. Well, you know, um, I had another call one time, and it was a, up in the North Park area. If anyone lives in San Diego, they know, they know where that is. There's a whole bunch of little neighborhood bars and stuff, and so uh, and some old residential housing nearby. And... So we got to call another, you know, bar fight kind of a thing. And so as we got there, this wheelchair came busting out of the front door of the bar, just like pew, out onto the sidewalk. And he kind of spun around a little bit and then, you know, <laughs> back through the door of the bar. And so I was working with this guy. He was an old timer and he looked at me and he said, well, Officer Huntington, I believe there's an issue inside of this bar. <laughs> and so we went into the bar and there was another guy on a wheelchair inside of the bar. And these two guys were fighting with each other. And it was a bit like the other bar and that everyone was just kind of had their beer watching this little drama unfold in front of them. And it ended up being, it was like a veterans bar. So the, all these guys were old, you know, World War II Vietnam kind of vets and they'd seen better days, yeah. I think. And so, but it was the same deal. These guys were like running at each other and just crashing into each other. And they were just far enough out that they couldn't quite reach each other. So they were, they were fighting, but they were like fighting their, they were punching each other's fists like that, this is vivid in my mind. I could see them going like this and fighting each other's fists. And so, so we went in and we waited them out and we broke them up and all that wow. kind of stuff. And uh, everybody was happy and everybody cried like they always do afterwards. And they hugged each other because they loved wow. their brother and all that. So, <laughs> uh, so we, we, the guy I was with, Raymond Pulsifer, he looked at me and he said, Officer Huntington, I believe our work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, well, you, you know, and we left. <laughs> so. One of the most dangerous things in a bar fight is your partner. Because how many times has it happened that somebody was getting ready to hit somebody or whatever and they missed or glanced off and your partner hits you right in the face? Yes. We were uh, yes. wrestling a gal down on the floor and she had a broken That's arm right. and was trying to hit my partner with the cast. So he, he was getting ready to hit her and she juked. Next thing I know, I'm taking a roundhouse right in the face. You know, it half knocked me off. Well, 
at this point, since there's only now one of, of one officer on this wildcat, started fighting, and he tried to get, uh, we didn't do headlocks, but he had his arm around her, and then, no, 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 ah! She was biting him, almost bit him to the bone because he'd got his arm a little too close to her mouth. And uh, I said, well, hey, Boy, you know, that. you hit me, so you can take care of it. <laughs> it is amazing. I know what you mean. I was on the, you brought up a memory, though. I brought up, uh, uh, I was on the bottom of one of those kind of fights one time, and, and my partner was hitting this guy on the shin, <laughs> except it was my leg. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah and it was like i was going ow ow and he said i know i know i'm trying to get him off of you and i no. said no no wait ow ow he said i know i know and so anyway <laughs> that's a true story so hey i did think of one more olympic uh sport and then we can end this and that is that are we allowed to say this i don't know but female bar oh, fights are often never pretty interesting never get in between and, two ladies and fighting I, and i I believe that could qualify yeah. for an Olympic sport, and we should probably end this now before we get arrested. Well, I so. actually had an, uh, when, that reminded me of something. I, I had a phase there when I was working night shift that we wore athletic supporters with cups, and it finally happened to me. And I I done this after a couple of fights where <laughs> ladies that's where they always go to, right? I, well, I probably shouldn't use the term ladies. These were not ladies, but yeah. um, you know the old saying: I would never hit a lady. But most of the women I dealt with were not ladies. But uh, after a couple of incidents where they you know went for the uh, the man's center of thought, um, a couple of us thought, well, let's wear athletic supporters with cups. And finally, one day, I was I had this lady drunk in a bar, and you know, look, you gotta go. And, I'm like, come on, lady. And I reached for her arm, and she kicked me right between the legs. And it it was uncomfortable, but I had my cup on, so I'm, I literally, I wish I'd had the presence of mind to go, ha, 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 ha. But as it was, <laughs> the, Superman! The look on her face <laughs> you know, was, so. how, how did you withstand that? I'm like, Ma'am, that's right. That didn't work. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So that was always yeah. always a, a great thing. So if you're ever going to be, you know, a cop working the the bar district mm -hmm. or a bouncer, having a cup on can be pretty entertaining at times. But don't send us pictures, <laughs> no, please. No, so, not at all. Yeah. But uh, yeah. all right, I think have we beat this into the ground? Like, I think. You mean kind of like a bar fight? <laughs> uh, all right. That's just just later. old guys waxing nostalgic. So. We'll, uh, we'll do this some more sometime. Well, it's that wraps up another edition of the Gun Cranks. We're glad you stopped by and joined us for our fun frivolity, and hopefully there's a little information there someplace. So make sure you check out our respective websites, gunsmagazine.com, americanhandgunner.com, and americancop.com. And it's really important you hit that like and subscribe button down here below where you're watching the video. That's really critical. And please share some kind words on your own social media, maybe a link to an episode, because we got to justify what we're doing. We're having a lot of fun here, but it's really important that you guys support us by liking, subscribing, and spreading the word. So make sure you check all that stuff out online, and we'll have another episode for you sometime in the near future. So on behalf of Tom McHale, the editor of American Handgunner, Roy Huntington, our buddy and former boss, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. Woo!